Alrighty, everybody. So today I'm going to be doing the last section of my uh, modern philosophy segment of the historical review of my ontological thesis proof. So yeah, that's a mouthful. Also, I moved over from the whiteboard, which is over there, to this place because uh, there's uh, more light coming up from the windows. So, anyways, um, yes. And let's see, I have a podium this time too, which is very nice. Uh, it's very good. So, uh, yeah, so let's, let's kind of jump right into it and uh, see, see what comes up, see how this, uh, see how this goes. Um, I'm going to be starting today on, uh, let's see, page 63, um, and the, the third scholar which I'm talking about today is going to be Gottlob Frege, okay? He's a, he was a German philosopher and logician, so page 63. And as I said before, this will conclude the, uh, the, the section on modern philosophy. Okay, so Gottlob Frege, he lived from 1848 to 1925. <clears throat> With the publication of his magnum opus, The Begriffenship, in 1879, Frege set the stage for the flourishing of analytic philosophy. While most scholars would take this work as a sign of his place in the logical era, he can be explicated just as thoroughly uh, among men like Spinoza and Leibniz. Let us not forget the latter of the two single-handedly invented calculus, the fount of mathematical philosophy. In his seminal work, Frege built upon Leibniz's formal systems by highlighting the significance of, clear -cut logic, of a clear-cut logical framework. In this respect, his remarks on logic were helpful, but when he tried to transfer these ideas past the first order into concepts like ontology or the ontological argument, his analysis was less helpful. Therefore, the breakdown of Frege will cover two trends, his work on logic and his work on the logic of ontology. By dismantling his ideas on ontology, so too will his objections to the ontological argument be proven void. First, with regard to his logical framework, Frege was able to revolutionize the field by expounding a clear and concise definition of mathematical proof. His thoughts on defining proof proofs ultimately boiled down uh, to his problems with the nature of grammar. Frege thought that grammar was unclear and needed the help of logic to make it understandable. And now I have a quote. Um, if the task of philosophy is to break the, domi the, uh, the domination of the word over the human spirit by laying bare the misconceptions that through the use of language often arise concerning the relations between concepts, then my concept notation being developed for these purposes can be a useful in instrument for philosophers. I believe the cause of logic <clears throat> has uh, been advanced already by the invention of this concept notation. And then footnote 108, this is uh, Frege Gottlob and Alexander uh, Dietrich Alexander, uh, the Begriffenschiff, and uh, Friedrich Schiller, Universität, 1979. All right. Um, and I guess that, maybe that's page seven. Um, okay. So Frege noticed that in English, grammar can be interpreted differently in different contexts. This is problematic if one is trying to present premises with only one denotation, and denotation is the dictionary definition of a word. The consequence of a looser grammatical format is usually a fallacy of equivocation or one of its kin. Frege's solution to the problem was simple. Change the format of language. Uh, in his day, every conjuring of language was done in subject predicate form. In fact, the same basic shape holds true today. The form is, is as follows. Subject predicate form. Subject plus verb plus predicate. And then uh, page, uh, footnote 109. It's important to note that in Frege's time, definitions of subjects and predicates were different than they are today. Back then, a sentence was comprised of a subject which acted with a verb on a predicate. For example, John kicked the ball. Today, predicates are defined as every part of the sentence which is not the subject so that here it would be kick the ball. For the, purpose of this, for the purposes of this uh, analysis, as well as the remainder of the paper, the use of uh, a predicate shall entail the Freudian use of the word. There is, however, nothing about the rules of logic that would allow us to deduce this uh, form in argumentation. In argumentation, logic would include a format that is more mathematical by nature, Thus, Frege introduced this concept notation, now known as function form. 
So function form is capital F in parentheses little a. In this format, one would not argue John is human because this would follow subject predicate form. Instead, John would be equivalent to the variable j, which could be substituted into a function f of a for the value of a, and then uh, footnote 110 here. Uh, in more modern renditions, placing uh, a predicate with the value of a variable is called using an atomic formula as opposed to using a function formula, uh, or as opposed to using function form. Um, <clears throat> okay, the property of humanity would be ascribed to John in words as follows. For any function f of a, if f belongs to a, then a possesses the property of humanity. f of capital J, therefore, entails that humanity is ascribed to J. And here uh, in footnote 111, uh, in reading formal proofs, most people have the idea that they uh, may simply translate function form into subject predicate form. Thus, they would read f of j as John is human. For simplicity's sake, uh, this is usually allowed, uh, but having the, the formal definition in mind is important when trying to explicate clear terms for uh, complications such as property relations. The property ascription approach to philosophy is not only more engaging, but it is more complex and therefore less susceptible to misinterpretation. For this reason, function notation is implemented in most of the formal arguments throughout this paper. Indeed, most analytic philosophers are members of the Freudian cult. Some find logic so um, precious that they refuse to use, uh, they refuse to argue with any premises of pure grammar. Obviously, they use grammar outside of their formal jargon, but in an argument, logical form alone is used. And then uh, footnote 112. The only reason I emphasize this point with such consistency is that most uh, outsiders to the analytic tradition think this approach is used as a method to keep others out. It's probably not, okay? <laughs> that is uh, most certainly not the case. There, uh, there's good reason for such formalities, and none better uh, is qualified to ex explicate those formalities but the Grand Master himself, Galo Freire. Okay. Right. <clears throat> Another concept which is important to grasp when progressing through formal arguments is the type of quantification that's being used. And then uh, footnote 113, I say, when an atomic formula is quantified, it becomes a proposition. This concept will have more relevance in later dialogue on formal proofs. The two forms that appear most frequently are existential quantification and universal quantification. Existential quantification is symbolized with the backwards e uh, as follows. Backwards e of x um, and then f of x is defined to be equal to their existent x such that x has the property of the atomic formula f of x. Sometimes this quantification can be seen with an exclamation point as follows. Uh, backwards e, exclamation point, parentheses, x capital F, parentheses x. This is going to be defined to be equal to there exists only one x such that x exists and x has the property of the atomic formula f of x. The second type of quantification is broader, ranging in its domain, and is referenced as the universal quantifier. Uh, the universal quantification, universal quantification is expressed as follows. Uh, it's going to have the upside down a, parentheses x, and then f of x, is defined to be equal to, for every x such that x exists, x is f. With these basic principles in place, the reader is in a position to understand the main thrust of the task Frege is undertaking. However, the more interesting points arise, or the, <laughs> however, the more interesting point arises um, when, one is exam when one examines the metaphysical and ontological conclusions that he drew from these principles. It's important to note that before perceiving, Frege eventually gave up his god of logic when he met the force of Russell's liar paradox. Quote, uh, or I'll, I'll do this to symbolize quote and then unquote, I guess. Um, so, a scientist can hardly uh, <clears throat> meet with anything more undesirable than to have the foundations give way just as the work is finished. I was put in this position by a letter from Mr. Bertrand Russell when the work was nearly uh, through the press. Unquote. And then uh, footnote 114, Frege got love the foundations of arithmetic, a logical mathematical inquiry into the concept of number. And I hope I'm talking loud enough so that everyone can hear me. Um, but yes, so, good. Uh, okay, so uh, it's, it's not that Frege began to think of logic as impotent, that meaning that it doesn't have any power. 
but Russell was able to show uh, him the perils of praying five times a day to uh, a blurry image in the Platonic heaven. So that's just me being metaphorical, but basically what I'm saying here is Frege really did a bunch of work on this, okay? We're not beginning to um, expunge the depths. Um, I don't know if expunge is the right word there, but um, we're not beginning to explore the depths of, of what Frege has, has done. We're just, we're getting um, the basic concepts spelled out so that if someone has never seen these or heard this before, they can have a basic understanding of what he said so that we can move forward and then analyze his, his um, positions on the ontological argument. And also it's been like four years, four years since I've done this, so I might be a little bit rusty on some of this. But uh, yeah, yeah, so I didn't like, before this I didn't like, um, oh, what do, you, what do you say? I didn't come in like, ah, oh, I'm gonna read through all this again. But, so yeah, that's that, I might be a little bit rusty, but whatever. So I, I used a lot of metaphors in this thesis, and the reason I used a lot of metaphors were, um, but, well, there were multiple reasons, but one of it was to kind of relate to people a little bit more, the other was to kind of like, I guess, show the, the structure of what was going on. I, I'm not gonna get, get too deep into that, but that's that's kind of, Freddie was doing a bunch of stuff and Russell was kind of like, yeah, I mean, there's some good stuff there, but it, it, the, the foundation of it, there's there's problems with this, paradoxical. All right, so, um, moving on. The first appearance of Freddie's musings on the ontology of logic and mathematics appear in his 1884 book, Foundations of Arithmetic. It was there that Freddie maintained the view that, quote, or that, uh, Every individual number is a self-sufficient, uh, self-subsistent object, unquote. And then, uh, wait a second, I think I did not read, uh, I, I didn't read footnote 115, so let me, let me turn the page back and I'll, I'll start, I'll do that. So, um, it's not that Frege began to think of logic as impotent, but Russell was able to show him the perils of praying five times a day in the blurry image, to a blurry image in the Platonic heaven. I know that's a confusing metaphor, just, forego that if it doesn't make sense or if it repulses you. Okay, um, so footnote 115. Without delving into these formalities, uh, without delving into the formalities of Russell's uh, version, basic liar paradoxes say something like the following. This sentence is false, unquote. The idea is that if, quote, this sentence is false, unquote, is true, then it is false. And if it is false, then it is true. Many attempted scholars' uh, solutions to this problem have been offered by uh, notable logicians like Tarski, uh, Pryor, Kripke, and so forth, but their solutions often create more problems than they solve. More notably, Kurt Gödel applied this reasoning to his first theorem of incompleteness to show the improvability of certain mathematical axioms that were traditionally held as valid. Now, I am not going to sit here and say that I understand every part, or all the parts, or even the majority of the parts of what Gödel has talked about here. But I do understand, and at this time I didn't understand enough of what he was saying to be able to write this. So I don't understand everything that Gödel has written. Obviously, I haven't taken that amount of time to go look at it. Um, but I, I get the basic, the basic idea. And since I've done some of this, this scholarly stuff, I think maybe just to have a little bit more idea than some other people or whatever. So, anyways, that's, that's why I wrote that there, and it's certainly true. But I just don't want anybody to think that I understand everything or even all the things or most of the things, you know that uh, girl has, has written, because there's a lot of stuff there. Anyway, so, um, after diagnosing the problems, uh, wait a second, let me make sure, nope, 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 I just went on to footnote 116. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna be repeating myself a little bit. So the first appearance of Frege's musings on the ontology of logic and mathematics appeared in his 1884 book, Foundations uh, of Arithmetic. It was there that Frege maintained the view that, quote, every individual number is a self-subsistent object, end quote. Now let's read footnote 116. This is Frege, Foundations of Arithmetic, Table of Contents, page, it's literally like page X. Okay. After diagnosing the problems with other theories of numbers, such as psychologism, and defending the radical notions of his own theory, Frege, Frege literally meant to convey that numbers exist. Since the ancient times, uh, a view such as this would be labeled realism with respect to numbers. It's important to point out that Frege did not believe that numbers existed spatially but he did maintain their weaker existence as concepts. In fact, he even made some fairly persuasive points along his way. For example, Frege notes that existential statements are a type of number statement. In at least some basic sense, this theory seems to be true. For example, if something exists, it does not have zero instantiations. At minimum, it has one instance. That's either tensed or tenseless. 
The problem with Frege's thinking is that it leads is that it later leads to unruly forms of quantification in which existence is almost read off of language. And I'm pretty sure that existence being read off of language, I think that's uh, a phrase that uh, Dr. William Lee Craig has kind of come up with in his study of aesthetic. So uh, it, it's a phrase. I don't know if you can coin a phrase unless you're like, um, what is it, Bruce, Bruce Buffer's brother who has Let's Get Ready to Rumble. So you can't, I don't know if you can really cite him for that, but I think that's where the, I think that's where this colloquialism or this, uh, this uh, phrase, reading existence off the language came from. Anyways, so I just wanted to make sure I'm citing my sources and everything. Okay. So, particularly in the quantum sense, quantification tends to lead to positing the existence of objects like cyclops and centaurs, so long as someone has thought of them. And then, uh, for 117 here, um, I understand that this is no longer, uh, debate and that technically it is not always the cyclops or the centaur that is said to exist but their concept alone. will say, like for example, behaviorists think that the brain is completely equivalent to the mind. So they'll say, ah oh, yes, there is a there is a mind that's just completely reducible to the brain. So I like to make the, the distinction. It's like, yes, we have a brain, okay, obviously. In addition to that brain, we have a mind, okay, and really after I kind of listened to Robin Collins talk about this a little bit, I, I figured out that we really should be talking about it the other way. We should really start with the mind first, because that's what we know first. We we knew that we were conscious and we knew that we were thinking before we knew we had brains. Um, and I, I realize that some people won't find that argument persuasive and they'll be like, yeah, but blah, 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 your, the consciousness of your mind is based on your brain. Let's not get into that, but basically I would say we have a brain, we have a mind, and in addition to a brain and a mind, both the, the physical and the physiological slash psychological component, there's also a spirit um, that it's spiritual. Sorry to reuse the phrase, but it just is. God is spirit. Um, and so the reason that we can have life and thoughts and all, all that stuff is ultimately because God has given us, uh, he, he's breathed life, in, life into us, and part of that is that we have spirit. Okay, in addition to um, our heart, in addition to the psychological component of our heart, which is, um, obviously the Bible says that our heart pumps blood throughout our body, and that blood is the life. Okay, that's why Jesus didn't want people, you know, uh, well, it's God that Jesus didn't want people drinking the blood of these animals. He was like, hey, pour it out on the ground because that, that is their life. You can eat the meat, but pour out the pour out the blood because that's their life. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's why I think of the heart as, um, you know, this is people say, well, why is the heart the center of affect? Well, that's kind of from a, from a theological position, and I'm going to rabbit a hole right now. Don't really care. Um, so, basically, that that's why we have, um, that's why I would say our our heart now we have to be a little bit careful here because our heart isn't literally well i don't think it literally is the center of our emotions but that's why I, we speak metaphorically about it the heart gives blood to the rest of the body it, you know it we couldn't exist without our heart right so there's the the physical uh, part of the heart there's the psychological slash uh phys physiological slash psychological component which is our affect and there is the uh the the third component which is our soul and uh, so, yeah, that's that's kind of how I read scripture. I know there's a bunch of different interpretations about what the spirit and the soul are and all, all that. This is just how I kind of see them from reading the scripture. I don't know if I could point to any one verse that says your soul is is uh, affect and your spirit is is cognition. But I, that, that's just kind of how I see them, and I don't really know if there's a better way to interpret that. Anyways, so that that's just kind of how I see things now, and that's because at this time. Um, I may have said that I believed in God, but I didn't really have any personal experience in my life of who he was. And so I was able to write these great theses here, and then that God gave me the power to do that, but I didn't really feel his spirit in my life. And so um, that's why I kind of, you know, 
him okay with going on these going on talking about this and coming back and just explaining sort of more of the context of what's going on here because yeah and yeah so when I went off to college that's when it really kind of started and that's it's, it's you know so cool so it's just it's so awesome so let's jump back into uh, Frege and let me see how long I've been talking so Oh, good. So, okay. So I've been talking for about 20 minutes, which is, that, that's good. So, um, and let me just see where Gottlob Frege kind of ends, uh, just to make sure here. So, Okay, so I'm on page 67 right now, and this is the page 69, so that's that's perfect. All right, so um, then yeah, let's uh, let's pick back up at um, after footnote 117. So this is page 68. Okay. The application of realism, combined with a strong form of logicism, led Frege to dismiss the ontological argument because he thought, and then here comes a big long quote from Frege. All existence talk should ultimately be carried by the existential quantifier, together with higher order concepts. Thus, quote, exists should never occur as a first order primitive predicate. Russell went so far as to say that, quote, God exists is bad grammar. On the other hand, Frege claimed that the statement, quote, God exists, when asserted, is really an assertion about the concept of God, namely that there exists something falling under this concept, or equivalently, this concept is not empty. And I'm not finished quoting him, there's one more sentence, but let me just say, I think this plays very well in the sort of the problem that Dr. Craig was having with aseity, divine aseity, where there's these sort of abstract objects that are necessary, they've always been existing, and he thinks this is a problem because God's supposed to be the only thing that's necessary and existing. I've got to say, I don't really find that to be a problem. I mean, I know aseity and it's the doctor and blah, 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 and yeah, I mean, if you think about it like that, okay, I, mean, I, I, I to some degree I get it, I just don't think it's a problem. I mean, I could because these uh, abstract objects could be like, for example, eternal, but eternally dependent on God, and that's I mean that's how I could see that. There's a bunch of different solutions that you could come up with, with, but that just seems very natural to me. Or you could say that they're in the mind of God, but whatever. If you want these to be like mind independent objects that are like outside of God's mind, like Platonists would, and say that these have been they've always existed, and that they in some sense have some weak form of necessity or because we, we wouldn't want to say that they're absolutely necessary right we, we, we would maybe say that they're, they have a weaker form of necessity then they could still be dependent on god for their existence and and i wouldn't see why that would be a problem um because they could be dependent on god's mind or, or some, something like that right um but but who, who knows that you know i, I thought a lot about it say but but you know, that maybe there's maybe there's a better solution or maybe there's more. I haven't read everything that Dr. Craig's written, I haven't even read most of it, right? It's so I always I'm always careful with that. But yeah. So so so. Alright. Um but this this really wasn't the problem here. Here he's just saying um, that there exists something falling under the concept or equivalently this concept is empty. He's saying, yeah, it references something to say that God exists, but it doesn't reference anything more than a concept. Well, that, if you notice, is the exact thing that Anselm is trying to say. It's like the second you say, the second you admit that, that there's a concept, that, that there's a, whether or not you say, you know, of course, when you say the concept is empty, that's not going to help you, but because if it's, what, is it, what does that even mean to say there's an empty concept? I mean, people, people don't do that, right? You, you have to give more, I mean, and, and I don't want to take this too far off track here, but <clears throat> basically, an empty concept is very hard because it's, it's talking about like something that's completely devoid but that still exists. So it, it's almost like saying uh, something that's full of nothing. It's like, okay, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but there, there's still some problems with there. So th those are just sort of some reflections that I've had. I know I'm going off on another rabbit trail, but it's not really a rabbit trail, actually, because Anselm was trying to say, once you have the concept of God, and not as an empty concept, but as an actually great being, then, well, and he didn't say an actually great being, Anselm in his verbiage says, a being that than which nothing greater can be conceived. So, there. Okay. Um, then you can get from the concept, as soon as you have that concept, then you can get to uh, existence and reality. So, and that's the way, that's the way it works for God. So, all right, 
So, this is the final sentence of the quote. Uh, there is no first order concept of existence according to Frege, which is kind of weird, I guess. Um, all right, so that's the end of the quote. And then footnote 118, this is Joel I. Friedman. Uh, and this is, uh, was Spinoza fooled by the ontological argument? Um, Philosophia, uh, 11, numbers 3 through 4, 1982, page 307 through uh, 344. So then, uh, let's see. Yeah, so why did I think this, I think I said earlier that this is a quote from Frege. It's not. It really is not a quote from Frege. It's a quote from uh, Friedman here. He's talking about what Frege believed. Okay. Anyways. So, first off, it's somewhat unclear what Frege means by uh, there is, quote, no first order concept of existence. And I don't know why I said Frege here. This should be Friedman. What, what Friedman means by no first order concept of existence. Um, so, yeah. If by this terminology he's implying that existence is an umbrella under which certain properties must be kept to comprise an object's essence, then he is accurately restating a doctrine that has been in existence for thousands of years. By simply expounding the situation of how objects exist, does nothing to touch the validity of the ontological argument. And I should have said, but but simply expounding this situation of how objects exist does nothing to touch the validity of the ontological argument. The point has always been that necessity is one of the attributes under the umbrella. If this is true, then existence must obtain, not just as a concept, but as reality as well. And, and let me just, this is, this is another thing that's actually good to say, is that um, that is how I believe Norman Malcolm wants to interpret Anselm's argument, as that he always meant for necessity to be one of these umbrella um, attributes under, um, under, uh, un under the concept of existence. Whether that was what Anselm meant, which probably I guess it was, or whether Hart Turner was just trying to cover up because um, Kant kind of gave a, a fair-ish rebuttal to the ontological argument, we don't really know. Uh, we don't know for sure. We can probably guess that, that, that if we try to really interpret Anselm the right way, and really interpret um, Hart Schorn and Kant the right way, then maybe that, that's what Anselm really meant. There's, there's different ways to interpret Prozology, and we're not going to get back into those. I'm pretty much, I think I've already talked about those, so... We don't want to get back to that, but let's uh, let's continue on this. So the point has always been that necessity is one of the attributes under the umbrella. If this is true, then existence must obtain, not just as a concept, but as reality as well. Second, as uh, second, saying, quote, God exists is not akin to saying something exists under the concept of God, or the concept of God is not empty. Saying God exists is to speak about definition in the same way that saying a triangle has three sides is to speak about definition. The truth is in how the term is defined. Lastly, and too commonly neglected, is the idea that the only statements that are true are those whose reference can fall under the domain of the existential quantifier. This type of talk is obtuse. It is really the case that the statement, quote, Snow White is equal to Snow White, or, sorry, is it really the case that uh, the statement Snow White is equal to Snow White is false? Uh, clearly, this statement is a tautology, and tautologies uh, are true by definition. And I think, uh, yeah, I think Dr. Craig said something similar to this, where he was talking about maybe Zeno is equal to something, or no, Zeno is equal to Zeno. I don't know. Anyways, this is not to say that the reference Snow White exists, but it does uh, show that not all existence talk should ultimately be carried out by the existential quantifier, unquote. Um, for if this were the case, we can never prove the falsity of statements such as, quote, Snow White is equal to Sleeping Beauty, or Sleeping Beauty is not equal to uh, Sleeping Beauty. To be fair, Frege does lodge other objections to the ontological argument, but because of their complexity and because of the fact that most of them rely on his faulty theory of descriptions, uh, they will not be explicated here. And then, uh, footnote 119, I say, for a supportive analysis of Frege's theory, C.F.J. Uh, Pelletier, I think is how you say that, and Bernard Linsky, 2008. For a critical analysis, he speaks 2009. All right, everybody, so that is the end of the Gottlob Frege section, and uh, that is the end of modern philosophy under the historical review in the, uh, the thesis of the ontological argument. So uh, thank you so much, and uh, have a good day. Bye. Good. <laughs>